I'm a natural optimist. In fact, you know, my sister accuses, we, we remember everything differently in our childhood because she says I have a happy filter and I filter out anything that's negative. Uh, I don't know that she means it as a compliment, but I, I am naturally optimistic, but I actually am really optimistic at, of what's happening right now. There's a lot of confusion and suffering, but here's what I see coming out of this is I think particularly in how we work in the future of work. It, this is an incredible moment in time for us to show our humanity. Yeah. And, you know, we have for years been hearing people say like, I want to bring my whole self to work. You know, we need to create human centered workplaces. That is Liz Weissman, the New York Times bestselling author of Multipliers, how the best leaders make everyone a smarter. She was recognized as the top leadership thinker in the world by Thinkers 50 in 2019, and she's also the former VP of Oracle University. In today's episode, we look at the two types of leaders, which Liz refers to as diminishers and multipliers, as well as the five disciplines of each one. We also explore what causes some people to be a diminisher or a multiplier, how to react depending on which type of leader you work with, and what causes someone to be a diminisher or a multiplier. Liz also gives some real world examples and practical tips on how you can become a multiplier. You know, they start with that observation that I had years ago, that some leaders are smart, but they don't create intelligence around them. And I, I came to call them diminishers because they tend to focus on their own intelligence and capability, which causes them not to see or, or use, or in some cases, unfortunately, actively suppress others. So that's that's the diminishing leader. And the other is the multiplier leader, who's also smart and capable, but they use their intelligence in a way that other people around them become smarter and more capable. You know, they're leaders who see and use and grow the intelligence of others. The world is changing quickly. What do you need to know and do in order to be successful now and in the future? From leadership to the future of work to employee experience, this show will give you the insights and the tools you need to succeed and thrive professionally and personally. Make sure to follow me on Spotify or subscribe to the show on your favorite platform you can do so easily by going to futureofworkpodcast.com. Also, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show, and I personally appreciate it. Hey, Liz, how's it going? Well, very good. Very good. All things considered, it's uh, there's a lot of challenges in the world right now, so... Yes, yes. And uh, I've had my own set of little technical challenges before we get start we got started today getting these little images uploaded just in time. So thank you for your patience and thank you everyone who's joining live. Um, as you can see, today's guest is someone who I'm sure many of you know. I have her book sitting right here. Uh, it is Liz Weissman, best-selling author of Multipliers. Um, and I love the subtitle of the book, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. A fantastic book that I had the opportunity to read, took a bunch of notes from. So Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, you know, it's absolutely a pleasure. Well, since, as you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, madness in the world right now. One of the things that I like to start off with these podcasts now is just to kind of get your thoughts on, on what's going on in the world. If you have any words of support or encouragement, do you see some sense of optimism um, in what's going on out there? Um, you know, Jacob, I'm I'm a natural optimist. In fact, you know, my sister accuses we we remember everything differently in our childhood because she says I have a happy filter and I filter out anything that's negative. Uh, I don't know that she means it as a compliment, but I, I am naturally optimistic. <clears throat> but I actually am really optimistic at, of what's happening right now. There's a lot of confusion and suffering, but here's what I see coming out of this: is I think particularly in how we work in the future of work, it, this is an incredible moment in time for us to show our humanity. Yeah. And, you know, we have for years been hearing people say like, I want to bring my whole self to work. You know, we need to create human centered workplaces. Well, you know, like voila, like 
here's me. Like that's the new world of working from home and Zoom. And you know, you think back. I don't know what was it a year or two ago. We all watched that uh, professor in South Korea when his kids came in oh, and yeah. he was broadcasting on the BBC, and we're like, oh, the shame, the horror. And now it's like the new normal, as they say. It's like, hey, this is me. This is like my life. This is who I am. I'm coming at you from my house. And, you know, I think there's this incredible moment for us to really see that we do bring our whole self to work. And it's hard to partition our work life and our home life. And, and to really kind of see into people working at home and to bring our humanity. And, and for leaders, this is the time for you not only to provide clarity and direction and be the calm and the storm and all of those things, but for you to double down on like seeing your team for what they're going through and showing your humanity and that vulnerability. So I, I actually think there's incredible value that's going to come in how we work coming out of this. It's going to be liberating. Yeah, and I totally agree. I think, um, more than ever, we're seeing leaders try to kind of step forward and be, I guess, good human beings first and then good business leaders second, just making sure that their people are okay, making sure that, you know, whatever, all, all the, the protests that are going on everywhere with COVID, financial troubles. I think a lot of leaders out there are stepping up and just making sure first and foremost that their people are okay before worrying about, you know, profits or sales or business or anything like that. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see that that, that is happening um, more and more. Um, so let's jump right into, uh, into your book, because I think there are a lot of really applicable insights and stories, especially for what's going on now. And the very first question that I thought we could start with, just kind of high level, can you talk about the, the two types of leaders that you address in your book? Uh, well, you know, they start with that observation that I had years ago, that some leaders are smart, but they don't create intelligence around them. And I, I came to call them diminishers because they tend to focus on their own intelligence and capability, which causes them not to see or, or use, or in some cases, unfortunately, actively suppress others. So that's that's the diminishing leader. And the other is the multiplier leader, who's also smart and capable, but they use their intelligence in a way that other people around them become smarter and more capable. You know, they're leaders who see and use and grow the intelligence of others. And, you know, by intelligence, I mean knowledge, skill, capability, insight. You know, they're leaders who we get to be fully capable around. And and what I found, it was so, it was shocking what I found in this research is that these diminishing leaders get less than half of people's intelligence. You know, what that means is people are walking, like they're badging into work yeah. with ideas and insights and capability that's not getting used. And, you know, it creates an environment which is disengaging and frustrating and and exhausting. Yeah. And we've all been in those types of environments, so we know exactly what that's like. Um, so, and I've, through my career, before I went off on my own, I think it's around 12 years ago now, um, I would say that I worked for a lot of diminishers. I don't think I've ever worked for a, for a multiplier. So I know firsthand exactly what that's like. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like the diminishers are the ones that they sort of suppress their, their people and the multipliers kind of expand and, and unleash their people. Yeah, it is. They, you know, the multiplier players are igniting the intelligence, unleashing that intelligence. You, know, you might think of it, since you mentioned leash, like the diminisher leader has someone probably on a choke chain Yeah. where the multiplier leader is someone who might be more like letting someone off leash, but, but maybe holding on, not completely like free range. It's not a hippie leadership. It's not like, hey, do whatever you want, knock yourself out, like be innovative, like go for it. It's, it's more like um, somebody who's holding the strings of a kite. Got it. Like allowing something to soar or elevate, but not free fly or free fall. It's like, I'm going to guide you, but it's lightly. It's that, it's a lighter touch on leadership as opposed to, you know, I had a, um, 
there was a guy who worked for me at Oracle for 10 years, Ben Putterman. And like Ben always kept me down to earth as a leader. Like one of the things he would do if, if I was getting um, a little too micromanaging, he would, um, he would like, just like we'd walk out of the meeting and he'd go like this, like, you know, like, he's like, Liz, you got me on a choke chain. And, and he never had to say the words. He just would give me the, ah, and, and I would know like, okay, I need to back off. Now I was never like trying to actively silence him. I just was so excited that I would jump in and I would be a little too big and he would know like, hey, I need a little bit more room here. Hmm. That was actually going to be my next question. Um, and that is, are diminishing leaders, are they bad leaders? I mean, it sounds like in your case, you didn't even realize sometimes that you were doing it. So you can be a diminishing leader, but not do it consciously or on purpose, like trying to micromanage and shut down your, your employees. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the big insight I found from the research was first and foremost, that these diminishing leaders were getting less than half of people's capability. Of course, paying people full price, getting less than half. The second big aha was that most of this diminishing was coming from the well-intended leader. So yes, yeah, some of it comes from the micromanaging, bully, narcissistic boss who's, you know, gives you little tasks to do rather than challenges and opportunities. But most of it's coming from what I call the accidental diminisher. And these are leaders who care about their people, want to be good leaders, trying to do the right thing. But like in my case with Ben, I was just excited to be collaborating with him. Yeah. Where so I needed to say, this is yours. Let me back away. Let me hold the strings of the kite rather than like. Yeah. No, makes enthusiasm. Sense. Yeah. And um, so we'll talk, I'm getting some questions coming in about the, um, how to identify if you're one or the other. So we'll get to those in a few minutes. Uh, but before we jump into that, I wanted to talk about um, the multiplier effect. So can you explain a little bit about what that is, how that works? Well, well the multiplier effect is what happens when you are getting all of people's capability. So it's what happens when people are able to work at a hundred percent of their capability. Now the multipliers we studied got on average 95%. But a lot of people said, and in fact, in my research, I asked people, what percentage of your capability did this leader get from you? And I said on a scale of zero to a hundred, and I defined those um, endpoints of the range. And I got a lot of people who said, well, 120, 130%. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not asking for hyperbole. Like, hey, I gave it all, I tried. I said, I want to know how much of your intellect was being used. Mm -hmm. And they said, 120. I'm like, no, 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 let me explain this again. And what I did is I took all that data and I truncated it at 100. Because I thought, you know, 100 is all of your knowledge, your insights. And what I found is there were people who vehemently said, no, it's 110, 120. I'm like, why? And they said, they got things from me I didn't know I had. I'm like, okay, well, good for you, but that's still 100, right? It was there. They said, no, 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 there's more. I grew so much working for this person that it's not 100% anymore. Hmm. And, you know, we know this, that intelligence, it, it, it languishes, it shrinks, essentially, when it's not used. And when intelligence is challenged and used you know, applied, it grows, that we, we literally get smarter and more capable around certain kinds of leaders and people and colleagues and roommates and family members. And that is really the multiplier effect. It's getting all of people's capability plus a growth dividend. And then the dynamic that happens across an organization where people come to work knowing that not only are they going to be fully utilized, they're going to be challenged, that you need to show up like game ready. Yeah. That's the multiplier effect. So when you unlock the the, the potential and you kind of support them and enable them to, to use their full intelligence, it goes kind of like above and beyond uh, that, that 100%. And it does. And as it happens, not just with one person, 
with many people across a team. And then you start to build a culture where it's the norm, where people say work isn't a place that's frustrating and exhausting. Work is a place that's a little bit exhausting, but totally exhilarating. Now you've built a culture which becomes self-sustaining. Like this Mm. is just, and, and it really is the kind of enterprise that you and, and, and many others have been writing about. It is the future of work. Can you actually talk a little bit about the research? I realized I never actually asked you, because um, you did quite a bit of research uh, for this to figure that out. Uh, so can you just share some of the research that you did and maybe um, some of those findings that you were talking about? Yeah. So the way that I do, um, I did the research for multipliers, and I really see myself as a researcher kind of first and and foremost is I went in, so I did not pick who I thought were multipliers and diminishers. Like that would have been easy and fun. And it would have been a book about like, hey, let me tell you about my least favorite work experiences and my favorite bosses. I went, I identified professionals that I respected, people who were successful in their careers, people who had often if not always had management experience themselves and people who didn't have an ax to grind, you know, which is sort of an idiom, meaning they're not bitter because I just didn't want to hear about baggage. I wanted to hear about. So then we, I went to these people and said, describe to me about a situation where you were able to do this. And like, what were, what did you do and what did the boss do? And that might be a multiplier situation. And then describe a so you know that would be, describe a situation where you're absolutely at your best, when you're able to solve hard problems, deal with challenges, you know, where you're like blah blah blah. And then I ask people to identify a different situation where they're holding back, playing it safe, hmm. where problems aren't getting solved, where problems are actually growing. And so I then ask them to to talk about their boss in these situations and describe what did the leader do? How did he or she think? And at the core of all of my research and and all of the books I've done has been trying to understand what are the behaviors that lead to certain kinds of outcomes, in this case, someone at their best versus someone at their worst. And then what are the mindsets? And you know, here's what's funny about the research, Jacob, is I thought people would very easily be able to identify the behaviors of their bosses, but would struggle to identify their their mindsets, their beliefs or assumptions. And I was exactly wrong, exactly opposite. Because Hmm. when I asked people to talk about like one of their diminishing bosses and say, okay, well, what did he or she do? Well, you know, hmm, like they eventually got there. But when I asked them, well, what did he, what did he or she believe to be true? Oh, that he was the smartest person in the world. Oh, Mm. that she didn't think I could do it without her intervention. It's funny. They were like this, able to identify, here's what was going on in their head. Isn't that interesting? It is. It actually reminds me like, um, I'm just thinking, you know, if I ever get in like a, 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 an argument or something with with my wife and then later on she'll, she'll be mad at me and I'll say, well, can you tell me what, you know, what did I do that made you so upset? Or she'll ask me the same thing. And then oftentimes it's like, well, you know, I don't I don't remember exactly what you did, but it, like it sort of reminds me of that. Like I, I know. But I know what you were thinking. Exactly. Like and I know. she totally knows. Like you had this assumption going on yeah. that like I was like planning the trip without you. And exactly. like whatever it is. And it's funny how we we are really skillful at reading people's um, intent and their assumptions because it just it oozes out in our behavior. Yeah. So I was yeah. very surprised by that. Yeah, but but now that I'm thinking about it, like um, you know, with my wife or with friends, I mean, I, it it does make sense because I, I I know we've all been in that situation where it's like somebody doesn't actually do something, but you can kind of tell like the direction that they're going in, and that's what makes you upset as opposed to something directly that they did. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't normally, until you mentioned it, I wouldn't have actually picked up on that. Uh, okay, so the mindsets they were able to identify instead of the, um, the specific. And, and so what came out of the research was, okay, two different kinds of leaders. Mm-hmm. How do they each think? Like, what are their assumptions? What behavior does that generate? 
And then what impact does that have? Which is like, in short, the diminisher holds this mindset that nobody's going to figure it out without me. You know, they don't have to hold the mindset, which is like, hey, I think I'm surrounded by idiots or no one else can figure it out. They're all dummies. It's no one can figure it out without me, Hmm. which causes them to do a set of things, which then causes them to get less than half of people's capability versus the multiplier whose assumption is, hey, you know what? People are smart and they're going to figure it out. Hmm. You know, like I can be helpful in that, but I'm not needed. Like I'm not the key ingredient in that, Um, which causes them to do, in, in, in this case, five things that I could see that they do very differently and they get all of people's capability. And then this growth dividend, which creates this multiplier effect. And that really was at the core of the research. Hmm. Okay. So the mindset, uh, cause I think this is really important for a lot of people who are um, watching or listening. So I guess one way that you can identify the diminisher versus the multiplier is if you yourself or your leader always, if you always believe that you need to be a part of the solution, um, then chances are you have the mindset of the diminisher. Whereas if you believe that, you know, you can provide guidance or coaching if it's needed, but you don't need to be there for others to be able to come up with a solution, then you're more of the multiplier. Yeah. And and it's not that the multiplier is this hands-off leader because, you know, we've made some attempts at leaderless organizations and I don't think they go very well. No, Um, no. you know, we often think of leaderless organizations as, you know, going to create anarchy, but actually leaderless organizations tend to create inaction. Yeah. You know, it's not like a bad scene from Lord of the flies. It's, it's, it's more like, um, (laughs) I, I, this is how I refer to it at my house is like, if everyone's in charge of feeding the cats, then the cats go hungry. (laughs) Yeah, So it's like the leader plays a really key role, but it's more like they step in, they frame an issue, they start a debate, they ask a big question, they offer a challenge. So they kind of come in big, but then they retreat Yeah, and then let other people jump in. So it's not like it's a passive hands-off. It's actually um, a pretty active, if not aggressive intense way of leading. It's just not always on. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I think that makes complete sense. Um, Okay. So are there any other uh, maybe characteristics that people should be aware of as far as distinguishing between if they themselves or their leaders are either a multiplier or a diminisher? Yeah. You know, now I could, I could share with you, like here are the five disciplines of multipliers, but I think probably a more useful way is for me to share a few ways that we can accidentally diminish it. Okay, which I was going to ask you about those five uh, uh, five things later too. Okay, so let's talk about just ways, common ways that people end up accidentally diminishing. And um, maybe what I'll do, there's nine that I see on a regular basis, but let me start with the couple that are, are my vulnerabilities and then the ones that we see really frequently. Okay. For me, like what gets me is I am an idea guy. Like I'm a fountain of ideas. And these leaders, they think like they're full of ideas. Hey, what about this? Why don't we try this? Have you considered this? Well, why don't we do a task force? Why don't we? And they think what they're doing is that their ideas are stimulating other people's ideas. You know, they want a creative, innovative, like rich environment. They think they're getting the party started. But what happens around these leaders is other people don't have to think like, well, okay, you know, either I spend my days running around trying to implement Liz's ideas, or I don't actually need to think very hard. I'll just like ask Liz what she thinks. Like we become idea lazy around people who are idea rich. That's one. I am so guilty of this. I have to learn all the time how to turn off my idea guy. And I do it by um, like asking myself a singular question. When I get all wound up on a new idea, oh, this would be fun. We should try this. I say, Liz, do you want the people on your team to stop what they're doing and work on this right now? The answer is almost always no. Yeah. Like, then you know what? Take out a piece of paper. Like, I keep, you know, a stack of post-it notes handy. And I just, like, write my ideas down. I stick them places and say, you know, that last a day 
or even a week, I'll bring it up at the next team meeting. But so, so being like idea rich is one. Um, another one of my vulnerabilities is I am optimistic, as I mentioned. And you would think that my team would very much appreciate my optimism, but not everyone does. Like we find that optimistic leaders often overlook, you know, these are hopeful, positive, that see upside, they often overlook struggle and challenge. And like right now, like people need to know that their leaders understand how hard things are yeah, because they're isolated because they're trying to work virtually when they've been working physically because the economy is is um tight or um oppressive even uh so i've learned to spend more time like understanding the struggle and saying things like hey what we're doing is hard we might not succeed at this a lot more time talking about the downside hmm. so that people around me understand that I get it and they can focus on the upside. So those are two I struggle with. I have, I have a problem with that too. My wife always tells me, um, you know, like if, if something tough is happening, I tend to focus on the bright side of things. And she's like, why can't you ever just be negative with me on some things? Um, so I, I, I can totally relate to that. And the same thing with the ideas thing. And I'm sure my team hates when I do this, but I'm constantly like same way, you know, can we try this? Let's try that. Um, which is interesting because I know that some organizations really value, they call that innovation, right? Oh, you know, we need more ideas. We need more suggestions. We need more things to try. But it sounds like that can actually be sometimes a detrimental thing for leaders because it just kind of takes over. Here, here's the key to understanding accidental diminisher tendencies. It's really understanding two things. One is it's understanding the difference between your intent and your impact. Like you're mm. actually trying to generate innovation and creativity. But your impact is that you've provided all of it so other people don't need to do it or they're they're too busy running around following you. So your impact is to decrease innovation. The other important thing to like to fix this is to understand that every one of the accidental diminisher tendencies, and I'll mention the three most popular ones in a, in a second here, is their virtues. Like we want optimistic organizations. Yeah. We want idea rich organizations. But what happens is if the leader does too much of it, his or herself, if they embody that cultural value, then we have optimistic and innovative management, but not a broad organization. Like yeah. these are all things you want. You want people to move fast but you want it on your team. And sometimes the best way for the team to become this is for the leader to be a little less of it. Hmm. So the, the other ways that we see this happen a lot is um, uh, rapid responders, uh, managers who are like moving quick. They, you know, they see a text, they answer a text, they, an email comes in, they want their team to move fast. So they move fast. Oh, that's a problem for me too. Okay. So you're three for three right now. This will be fun. We're going to see if we can do like a bingo. A bingo oh, man. is it's not, looking, not looking good for me. <laughs> you know, if, if the manager is so quick to respond, then nobody else gets to do their job. Nobody else gets to take accountability because that manager has just taken it from them. So the little rule I use, I've had some rapid responder um, tendencies in the past is I use a 24 hour hands off rule, which means if an email comes in and one just came in on Friday, it was sent to me and one other person on my team who was actually the one responsible for this project. Well, I knew he was out for a bit in a meeting and he wasn't going to get to this. And my fingers are on the keyboard. I'm about to reply because I'm like, oh, this is important. And this person's going to want to hear from us. And I just take my fingers off the keyboard and I'm like 24 hours hands off which gives him a chance to come back from his meeting, come back from his son's little league game, whatever it is, and take ownership and responsibility. But people can't take ownership for something unless the manager lets go of it. Yeah. And so I do 24 hours, meaning I give other people a chance to respond, but if they don't respond, then I'm all over it. And usually yeah. it's, hey, this is yours, not mine. 
you know, can you get back to this person? Um, so rapid responding. The other is pace setting, meaning, you know, being the example of, let's say there's kind of a desire to be more market focused. So it's like, hey, let's read up what's happening in the industry and really knowing what what's going on in the economy, the market, or knowing what's happening with our customers. So the manager's like, okay, I want my whole team to do that. So I will, I'll lead the way. I'll model that. I'll spend time reading up on the market, spending time out in the field with our customers, knowing what issues they're dealing with. And what happens is they're thinking, I'll lead the way, I'll get out ahead, set the pace for the team, and other people will follow. But actually what happens is people hold back and they they watch. Like When we set the pace for our team, we more often create spectators than followers. Hmm. And, you know, like sometimes you have to put that slower person or the more junior person out in front and let them lead. Yeah. Something I learned hiking with four kids. <laughs> like take the youngest that everyone's yeah. saying, Joshua, go faster. Why can't you keep up? I'm like, hey, Josh, you know what? On this next segment, why don't you lead and set the pace for your older brothers, bro other brother and sister? Yeah. Well, what do you think what happens when I put Joshua out in front? He now picks up the pace and others are having trouble keeping up with him. Hmm. And the leader, you know, sometimes needs to, to march in the back. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose you need a little bit of self-awareness um, for this as a leader, because I mean, you need to be, well, I, I guess that kind of brings up an interesting point is you need to be able to identify these things in yourself, right? As a leader or other people call them out for you. Well, generally people don't call them out for us, which um, is why it's so important. You know, people don't usually say, hey, this thing that you're doing with the best of intentions, it's having this negative impact. It's learning to see it. Like it starts with, sometimes people can see it just on hearing the concept, like the yeah. idea guy, the optimist, the rapid responder, the pace setter, the rescuer, jumping in to save people, the protector. Oh, you know what? Don't take the hardship assignments. I'll do it. You can take the easier things. The the big, bold visionary who does all the thinking no one else has to, the perfectionist who just loves to get it right. <laughs> but like people are getting their work recorrected all the time. Um, yeah, Sometimes just that will help you know. We've got a little quiz um, on multipliersbooks.com that a lot of people take that gives them sort of a, it's a self-assessment. It gives you a little bit of a, a suspicion. But what it really comes down to is, is talking to your team. And it's it's not, am I a diminisher? <laughs> it's like, you know the answer to that question. You know, it's not even saying, hey, am I an accidental diminisher? Mm, of course not. It's asking in what way, like with the best of intentions, could I be suppressing creativity? Hmm. Or, you know, um, disenabling like ownership. Like, how am I doing it? Like, tell me the good things I'm doing that are actually causing bad things to happen. And when you frame it that way, people can tell you, oh, well, like, Liz, I know you're trying to do this. Like, you're trying to cheerlead me. But actually, what I need right now is someone to, like, just be a little bit. What was the term you used with your wife? Can you just be a little bit negative? Or Yeah, she, she frequently says that. Can you be a little bit more more negative with me? Yeah, what she's saying is, I need you to acknowledge that I am struggling with something. Yeah. Like, don't try to happy me out of it. Just like, would you join me in the struggle for a moment yep. before we climb out? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I try to I try to work on that. But, you know, it's my wife, so she has no problem calling me out on, on anything that I do. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, all of these problems would be fixed if we just treated each other like um, in spousal relationships. Exactly. Exactly. Don't hold back. Uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, the diminishers. Maybe we can talk now about the multipliers. So what are some of the things that multipliers do? And can you also be an accidental multiplier? You know, um, there are some people that I would consider accidental multipliers and they don't realize they're either they were just like born and raised like at their mother's knee with this real sense for like, hey, don't get so big for your britches. And, 
you know what, it's not about you, it's about others, like be the person who enables others. Like they were either just raised right and they do it naturally, or maybe like me, you're just lazy enough that you end up doing it right. Like I think the lazy man's approach to leadership is not a bad one. It's like, oh man, I'd have to think really hard to solve this problem. Why don't I just use my team instead? Um, or you know what? I don't have the energy to micromanage. Like I'm going to trust you. Okay. So what is it that these multiplier leaders do? Um, for one is they, they see and use people's um, natural genius. I call it their native genius, the thing they do easily and freely. If you want a little technique to be more of a multiplier this way is don't look at people as in their job descriptions or their resumes. It's like, look for what they do easily and freely. Like what they're going to do, whether it's their job or not, what they're going to do, whether you ask them to do it or not. Like, it's just that thing they're going to do. We all have something like, it's just like, my mind just does this and, and build a job around that or find parts of the job where that can be used. Like you will get a hundred percent from people and then more. That's one, two, they, um, they give other people space. Hmm. Uh, you know, they create some psychological safety, but they also give other people space to think or disagree. Um, my favorite, like simplest thing that you can do is to give people time to think rather than, um, ask people to think extemporaneously, spontaneously is my simplest thing I've learned to do is send an agenda out in advance, at least 24 hours, if not 48 or, or even like 72 hours in advance, not just with a set of topics, but a set of questions. Like here are the things that I want us to find answers to. Can you come into this meeting like ready to go? Particularly if you are, extroverted by nature <laughs> and you like those sort of spontaneous conversations like it, I've learned that my my more introverted colleagues like they want time to think so give people some space and some time to do their best thinking and you know I think there's something Jacob in your work that I read that it's like it's this acknowledgement that the best thinking, can't be taken. It has to be given yeah. voluntarily. And so give people some space to be able to give, not just taking, um, you know, another thing is to, instead of telling, asking, asking questions, I really see that asking good questions is like the top skill of good leaders. Um, instead of giving people tasks or even goals, or MBOs, as they're often called in the corporate world, give people challenges, like hard stretch challenges, like give them the, the, the question, but not the answer, like give them a puzzle, lay out yeah. the puzzle pieces and let them solve it. Um, you know, instead of making the decisions, become a debate maker for your team. Yeah. Frame the issue, ask the question. And, you know, instead of micromanaging, you know, put other people in charge. And Jacob, my favorite, like simplest thing here, it, it came from uh, simplest, simplest management technique came from um, one of my interviews. And it was uh, a vice president who had been hired by John Chambers at Cisco. And John Chambers is the new CEO. He's hired his first vice president. And he tells Doug, and Doug's going to run customer support. He says, Doug, when it comes to this part of the business, you get 51% of the vote and 100% of the accountability. And I just think it's so brilliant. He didn't, he, he didn't give him 100% of the vote because what he's saying is like, consult me as your boss. Like, I want to I have ideas. I want to give input. I want to be informed but you know what? In the end, this is yours to decide. And I think it's the simplest way of putting somebody else in charge is telling them, yeah. you know what, on this part of the project or for this whole project or just for this little decision, you get 51% of the vote. 
Hmm. And it creates this wonderful partnership between 49 and 51. And it's pretty clear, like, you're in charge. And, you know, put other people in charge and then do your best not to rescue them when they struggle. Uh, try to keep them in charge. Do you have any favorite uh, examples or, or stories of either companies who you think do a good job of cultivating or bringing in multipliers or any particular leaders that come to mind that exemplify a multiplier? Oh, this is a tough question because it's not a lack of it's okay. There's so many. It's like asking me like my favorite books. Uh, well, I think SAP has done a really, really good job of this. And I have to admit I had, uh, when I left Oracle, I had done some work at SAP, some coaching work. And when I first heard that they wanted to build multiplier leadership across the organization, I was very skeptical mm -hmm. because they had such a strong kind of command and control yeah. model of leadership. And I'm like, mm, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I was invited to participate. They, they've made a hu enormous difference in their organization. Um, by by teaching people this way of leading and and giving managers sort of time to get up to speed they created a measurement tool they measured two things on team one trust and the second was engagement so they didn't create a huge scorecard just we're going to measure two things and they did the training on here's how to lead like a multiplier. And then they waited six months before they introduced the measurement, which has said, you know what? We know this is not an overnight yeah. transformation. Like some of you are going to struggle to do this. And so they created this nice on-ramp to this initiative. Um, and then they started measuring it. And I, the numbers are failing me right now, but they're in the like – like mega millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars that they have seen because of how trust and engagement went up as a result. And then when they found certain managers struggling to improve engagement and trust, they didn't just say, hey, you're out of here. They they offered them some coaching. And again, like a time frame, like let's see over the next year how you do. And hey, you know, is it possible that maybe this kind of role could be better? And it's one of the best examples. Um, I'm sorry that I'm, I am I could flip through some papers here and find some of those numbers. But um, if you go to uh, the company BTS is a consulting firm that was working with them, their website, I think they've got a really wonderful case study written up on this. Um, in terms of multiplier leaders, give me an industry. Jacob, let's do, let's play like, name that leader give me an industry okay. and i'll see if i can come up with uh with well let's see probably the easiest technology software I suppose every company is a technology company these days yeah, they are you know um in technology one that comes to mind is lutz ziab i wrote about him in a number of places in the book but one of the things that um fascinated me about lutz he, he worked at Microsoft. He was the general manager of Microsoft Learning. And his team said, you know, around Lutz, you can make any mistake you want. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and then they were very clear. They're like, you can make any mistake you want once. Hmm. But, but you, no, they're like, nobody would, like, you can screw up. Like, you can try something creative. Like, one person described, yeah, I tried this, like, really kind of, innovative out there promotion to see if it was going to generate more sales. And they said it didn't. But the next time I went to try a promotion, I'm like, I knew, like I already used my mistake on this. Like I yeah. need to demonstrate that I've learned from that. And, and people just said he created this environment where it was okay to experiment, but you had to learn from yeah. your mistakes. Um, if, if you want more examples, just name an industry. That, that'll that help me pick one. Oh, man. what's uh, What about like uh, automotive or, or pharma or? You know, um, so let's do automotive. You know, it's hard not to want to, to point to Alan Mulally. And, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> and I've had a chance to like meet with him and spend some weekends learning more about how he led 
And he, you know, he's if if people haven't heard of him, he 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 led, he presided over this massive turnaround inside of Ford Motors. Yeah. I was very troubled. He took it on, but I think there's a couple things he did that are very multiplier esque. One is he just created um, total transparency in his meetings. He um, he stopped holding one on ones where everyone's kind of angling different. Well, we can't do this because of that. And he said, all decisions are going to be made in the open. And he, put, you know, a tra um, transitioned everything to, I think they were, I can't remember the day of the week, but they were early, like a three hour meeting once a week with the whole executive team. And he's like, here's where we're going to go through all the issues. And not only did he force that it had to happen out in the open, he asked his executives to bring a junior person from their organization with them. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. So think about what that does. So, you know, you go from one-on-ones where everyone's kind of like jockeying and angled and giving you the information you need to creating like a debate where it's now an open forum. We talk about the issues openly and now invite a young person, junior manager or whatever from your organization, maybe someone from the shop floor, maybe one of your direct reports, like, it's brilliant. What does that do? One, everyone behaves really well during those meetings. Two, there's like total transparency, honesty. Three, it's teaching others how to operate at the executive level. It's exposing people to what our key issues are. It's helping everyone stay on the same agenda. Um, but, you know, that's one where he's like, pulling all of that intelligence out into the open. Um, so he he's an obvious person from automotive. I have to think if there's someone. Um, no, he's I, a great one. He's a great one. And well, we can do one more if you want, or we can move on. But no, those are two great, great stories. I mean, and you talk more about, um, I mean, in the research, I think you've written articles, you have it in the book. So people, if they want to get more examples, I think it's pretty easy to find them from, from the work that you've done. I have a bit of a jukebox of examples of, both great and bad leadership. The problem is there's too many songs. In yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, I know we only have around uh, 10, 15 minutes left. So I thought maybe we could transition a little bit to, um, well, first is when you get brought into organizations, what's the most common thing that they ask you to do? Because I'm, I'm assuming they don't just come to you and say, hey, Liz, we need more multipliers, make multipliers in our company. What are the specific problems they come to you with? Yeah, you know, the, here are the problems that they come. I'm going to try to cast this the way it's changed over the last decade, because I know your work is around the future of work. I think it shows us where we're headed. Initially, it was, boy, you know what? Our people are struggling trying to do more with less. You know, how do we get the most out of the resources we have? That was one use case to okay. borrow a term from the software world. The second was... Oh, you know, we're trying to innovate. Um, how do we get more ideas, better thinking, kind of space for innovation and experimentation? Another is we're trying to grow fast. Like what does leadership at scale look like? Meaning what do we need to do differently as we are rapidly growing? Because you really do need to think differently yeah. about how you lead as you, as you scale. Uh, another would be engagement. And that's kind of been the... I don't know, the rally cry for this last decade in some ways has been the decade of engagement, meaning our engagement scores are down. How do we, you know, what do managers need to do to help people stay engaged? More and more we're seeing, and I'm kind of giving you these as layers, more and more we're seeing um, diversity and inclusion as being kind of the focal point, meaning how do we create an environment where all forms of intelligence are seen and heard like how do we get all caps diversity meaning a rich set of perspectives and ideas and what can managers do to utilize um to, to include different perspectives and different knowledge and insights and talents into the mix so that we can be more innovative or grow and um you know, more and more like kind of bringing it up to the present, it's how do we manage uh, remote teams? Yeah. And, you know, uh, I've got 
you could find it out on Twitter or LinkedIn, but I've done a post on um, like mul multiplier pro tips for managing remote teams, as well as how do you lead in an environment of uncertainty? And I've shared a few tips on that, but, you know, more and more, Jacob, I like the fundamental role of leadership has, has changed. Yeah. And I think back to when I was a corporate manager and an executive, um, we did a training program. We had an outside vendor come in and he talked about like a leader's job is to take people to a better place, which is, you know, you think about like iconic leaders, but I don't think that's the leadership job anymore. It's not like, Hey, I've, I've seen a new world. I know a better place, like the grass is greener, like come with me to this, <laughs> this better place. Like the reality is leading today is about leading in the dark. It's about, I, I don't know where we're going because I haven't been there. Like we haven't invented it yet. Like it doesn't even necessarily exist. What I need you to do is like, come with me as we navigate like in the dark and try to find our way to something better, something more sustainable. Yeah. I, I love that analogy. Yeah. Tell me, what does it make you think of? Well, because, the, the, you know, the world of work is changing so quickly. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, an, an explorer going off on an adventure. Uh, but back in the olden days, before we had all these uh, high-tech instruments, and it was kind of like, you know, we're going to set sail and we're not exactly sure where we're going to end up, but, you know, trust me and come on this journey with me. And I think that's exactly what we're starting to see today because things change so quickly. We don't know what the future is going to bring. And so we need leaders who understand it's not, you know, I've seen the better from a past job, from a past company, and I've done this already. And I'm going to take you there to this idea of, you know, things are changing quickly. And I can bring experiences and knowledge and, and and things with us on this journey. You know, we can equip ourselves as best as we can with the supplies and the tools and resources, but ultimately we're not sure the path that we're going to take. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what pops into my head is the, the explorer journey. Yeah. And, and it's like, come with me and we're going to figure this out together. It's such a different leadership model than I know where we're going. Follow me, which is like the, Peanuts um, cartoon strip with like Snoopy and yeah, yeah. stock birds behind him. It's yep. let's figure this out together, which requires trust. You have to trust that the leader has intelligence and capability, but more importantly, it's the leader saying, I don't have the answers. I just know we need to go. I have some of the questions, but I'm going to use the intelligence of the team in the moment. You know, it's more like special ops. Yeah. And, and we're going to figure this out together and I will guide us, trust me to guide us. But the real task is how do we utilize all eyes? Like, one of the things I have a pet peeve of mine is when they say like leaders need to be able to see around corners. Oh yeah. <laughs> like you don't get any bigger eyes when you are the leader. It's like the only way to see around corners is to have multiple perspectives, like the superhero model of leadership. Like if somehow I, I know better. Well, that's, it um, really it doesn't hold up. So the, from the CEOs that I interviewed, that was the number one skill that CEOs identified as being most crucial for future leaders. Uh, I called it, uh, thinking like a futurist, which is the ability to not necessarily see around a corner, but to be able to think in terms of those different scenarios and possibilities and perspectives. Um, because I think that's something a lot of leaders sometimes struggle with. They pick one path and they kind of go down it. But when things change so quickly, you have to kind of visualize different scenarios. And I always draw the analogy between a game of chess. You know, what separates an amateur chess player from a great chess player is the great chess players, you know, the amateur thinks in terms of like, I will move one piece, my opponent will move one piece, and it's just like one move here and there. But top chess players, they think in terms of scenarios. I can move one of these pieces, my opponent might move one of those pieces, and this is how I'll respond. So you have these different scenarios and possibilities playing out instead of just kind of one-to-one, -one, uh, which I think is an important skill for sure. 
Well, and, and Jacob, to that point is for those people who say like, okay, I understand that that's an important skill, but like, how am I going to suddenly develop a strategic brain? Yeah. Like the way you can do it is by having a team of people who are watching for you and thinking yep. with you. I, you know, think of like a scene out of a movie where you've got like a commander and there's all the special ops folks and they're all in their position. It's like, okay, what do you see? What do you see? Like the way you get that picture yeah. is by drawing on Intel yep. from a diverse team, Could, everyone in a different position and seeing something different. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Uh, well, maybe in the last few minutes, what we can do is talk about um, just some ways that people can become multipliers. So if you have any specific like uh, tips or strategies, um, and also, do you need to be a leader to be a multiplier or can you just be an individual, you know, a leader of self, so to speak, and be a multiplier? Yeah, you know, it's one of the things that, that has been so inspiring to me about this kind of leadership is it doesn't require position and authority. Hmm. It It's a leadership model based in influence. It's about inviting people's contribution rather than demanding its contribution. And I think you can be a multiplier very much from where you are, you can lead from where you are. Um, maybe a, a final thought on what you can do. You know, if, if you are leading remote teams, people need more clarity. And um, I, maybe like a simple practice would be letting people know the three what's. Like when you're giving a piece of work, let people know Number one, here's what good looks like. Here's the quality criteria. See, often people are trying to guess what does the boss want? Let them know what good looks like. Let them know what done looks like and let them know what's in scope. It's essentially giving people a statement of work. And when you give people a statement of work, it allows them to operate independently and remotely where it's harder to check in. So instead of just trying to move fast and get work off your to-do list and onto someone else's. Think about giving people the three what's and setting them up for success. Uh, two, we may have covered it and I have forgotten, is like send out agendas in advance. Build your agendas around questions, not topics. And when you do and when you get people together virtually, like people will be ready and able to engage. So those are a couple of thoughts about leading in remote environments. Um, in terms of leading in times of uncertainty, probably two, two tips there would be number one, talk about your own mistakes. You know, when things are uncertain, when you're in the dark, people take smaller steps. They're afraid to make mistakes because they can't see what the consequences of those are. Um, Talk about time. In fact, we found it was the number one thing that leaders could do to encourage an environment of innovation and risk taking is to talk about their own mistakes. So avoid the temptation to do innovation by fiat. Like, hey, be creative, be innovative. That's one of the things I hate when people tell me, like, be innovative. Like the fact that you told me to be innovative did not actually help me become more innovative. In fact, yeah. in some ways it decreases it. Talk about your own mistakes. Let people know that you've made mistakes and can recover. Uh, and you can also talk about like your own fears and doubts about that will help people to talk about theirs. And then to make clear space for experimentation. Um, it's naive to assume, particularly in times of economic uncertainty and downturn, that um, when you tell people to be creative, like they're not going to want to do that because the consequence of making mistakes is amplified. Yeah. We found a, a great practice for this is to delineate, I call it delineate the playgrounds from the freeways. And hmm. what that means is you're saying, hey, you know, and because if you tell people to like take risks and experiment, and innovate, what's going to happen is like the experienced people are going to be, oh, she didn't really mean that because <laughs> that could be business ending. And the young people, the new people are like, cool. And they bring down like production databases and go, oh, bummer, dude. Sorry about that. And so what you want to do is you want to say, okay, in the work we do, there are places where we can experiment and recover, where mistakes are okay. Yeah. These are playgrounds. 
innovate, experiment, try, you know, new promotions, new products, new ideas there. But there are parts of our business where it's actually not okay to fail. And it's damaging to tell people to like be innovative and experimental. See, these are the freeways. These are the places where we've got to get it just right. And I might have to ma micromanage to get it there. This is where we're kind of more conservative, like play on the playgrounds, be cautious on the freeways. And when managers make that delineation, it's actually hugely liberating to people. Like, mm. okay, I know where to go be creative and experimental, particularly when things are uncertain and dark. Well, it sounds like the first step for people listening and watching this first uh, listen a couple of minutes ago where we talked about the differences between the multiplier and the, and the diminisher and to figure out which one you are. And so if you're a multiplier, I guess, keep doing what you're doing if you fall into that category. And if you're a diminisher, it sounds like what you need to do is start to change some of those behaviors and patterns. And in the book, actually, I think you have a, a pretty good breakdown. You have like a table where you compare the... Uh, the behaviors and the mindsets of the diminisher and the multiplier. And so you kind of just need to shift from one to the other. Yeah. I think like there's two charts in the book that are, are pretty helpful. One is at the beginning. It's this comparison of multipliers and diminishers. Maybe Jacob's going to like open up that book totally and, like and find it. Okay. Let's see. Let's see who can find these faster. Um, uh, and it's in chapter one. There's this, this, um, it used to be on page 23, but I think it moved in the new. Oh, here we go. It's on like page 28. It's right here. This is my desk copy. It's spiral bound. So oh. there's this chart that just like. Mine's plays. 23. Yeah, yours is 23. That, um, is that page 23? Oh, it is 23. I just can't see. So it's page 23. That's a pretty helpful chart. And I think you can probably find these on the website if you don't want to get the book. Um I try not to be a book pusher. And then um, this is this is my favorite chart of the whole book. And um, it's on page, I'm hiding behind it now, 20, uh, 208 and 209. And this, I think you can find on the book's website as well. But it is um, how it's nine of the accidental diminisher tendencies in graphic form. Uh, what the problem is with each what you could do instead. And it offers um, yeah. a multiplier experiment. Like, hey, here's a, a, a multiplier practice. Go try this. They're all detailed in Appendix E of the book. Or it offers a simple workaround, which is, you know what? Just try this, like do this one little thing differently and it'll have more of a multiplier effect. Yep, I love that. Um, it's a very, very helpful chart. So now that we're, um, okay, somebody asked really quick, um, the three what's, if you can just quickly repeat the three what's. Hmm. What does good look like? So it's a quality what? Yep. Because you have a secret standard in your head that you need to communicate to your team. You know, when you get something, you're like, oh, that was not a good job. Well, you probably didn't tell them what a good job is. What does good look like? Two, what does done look like? It's a completion criteria. And three, what's out of scope? Like, what are the boundaries? If you give people those three things, it's like a statement of work, and then they can work more independently. Good Perfect. or great, completion and um, boundaries. So, Liz, where can people go to learn more about you, the book? I know you have a great website for the book. There's uh, quizzes that you mentioned people can take. But anything that you want to mention for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Well, it's pretty easy to find. There's um, <laughs> and grab the book. Those of you watching, you can see I'm holding the book. Grab it. I have my um, my like uh, spiral bound version here. Is um, there's multipliersbooks.com. There's um, there's my other books too. RickySmarts.com. You can go there, and that is maybe even more relevant right now because it's about why learning is like how fast you learn is way more important than what you know right now. You know, sort of that master skill, that's rookiesmarts.com. And uh, then there's our little firm's website, thewisemangroup.com. And it's the Wiseman Group. If you go to wisemangroup.com, you will end up at a San Francisco-based interior design okay. firm, which I guarantee you their website is more interesting than ours. It may or may not help you be a better leader, 
but um, thewisemangroup.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Yeah, I'm, easy to, I'm easy to find. Both you're places. pretty easy to find with a quick Google search of your name. So I think people will be able to get in touch with you. Uh, well, Liz, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share some of the insights with me from your book. Well, it's my pleasure. And, you know, thank you for the work you do, particularly around the future of work, because I think there's a lot of us who envision the future of work being a place where people really love to go to work. Yeah. You know, they may or may not love their boss. I, you know, I'm trying to rid the world of bad bosses, but, you know, we want to create workplaces where people do their best work and it feels like human and joyful in yeah. the process. So thank you for your leadership there. Oh, thank you. I always say we want to create a place where people feel like they want, not where they need to show up to work each day. So I've, uh, I've been in those bad organizations. I know exactly what that's like. And um, it's not it's not fun for anybody. So hopefully we can work on changing that. Um, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Again, my guest has been Liz Weissman. Please make sure to check out her book, Super Easy to Find, Multipliers, How the Best Leaders Make Everyone Smarter. And I will see all of you very, very soon. Thanks again for tuning in to today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. I cannot express how important those reviews and ratings are to the success of the show. And they keep allowing me to bring back amazing guests. Lastly, don't forget to check out the brand new PDF that I just put out, which looks at the evolution of the employee. In other words, how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization should do to adapt. You'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like, as well as action items that you can and should be taking. That PDF is available at thefutureemployee.com. And if you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, whether it's inviting me to speak, sponsoring the show, or just giving me some feedback, you can always do so. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Again, that's jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Thanks again for tuning in and I will see you next time.